So let's go through some of your, your stocks. Your most recent trade is Expedia. Tell me why. Well, um, Expedia is a really interesting story. Great company. If you look back over the last 15 years, they've grown their earnings at 15%. Uh, that's kind of the growth rate you see from uh, Apple and Microsoft and Google. And yet Expedia, like I said before, it's got great growth, but it's around 11 and a half times earnings. Now, travel had a huge problem during COVID, but by early 2022, they were back to their pre-COVID earnings. They're 50% higher today, and yet we still have that low multiple. Some people worry about the top down, uh, about travel being above trend, but I think what they're missing is the bottom up story with Expedia is amazing. Uh, there's a huge margin expansion going on as they consolidate and focus on their core platforms. And people also don't realize that while we all know the Expedia site for online travel agencies, a quarter of the business is VRBO, which is growing very fast, and another quarter is a fast-growing B2B operation. Joe, you have this in, the, in your ETF. I, I do, and you know, we, we, we bought it pretty, pretty well, uh, below $100, and this is one of the few stocks where you could actually find momentum in the market. I know that's not what Andrew's targeting, uh, but in addition, to the strength of the balance sheet and certainly the way the business has been managed. And again, I think unfortunately Expedia and even Booking Holdings, I think a lot of people look at these companies and say, okay, what's the macro? And these are gonna be instruments that we're gonna utilize to reflect what our bias might be on the macro. And I just think it's the completely wrong way to look at these businesses. In the case of Expedia, I think another thing that benefits them as, uh, as well is not having the type of exposure to the Middle East that Booking Holdings did. So you saw a lot of rotation of money go away from Booking Holdings into Expedia because of that. Largest position overall right now is United Rentals. Yeah, um, may not be a household name, but all you have to do is walk around Manhattan and see a construction site, and you'll see lots of construction equipment with United Rentals slapped on the side. They're the largest equipment rental company in the US. Uh, their big driver of their business is non-residential construction. And I think this stock always people worry about cyclical concerns, that we're going to have a downturn. What is a huge potential offset to that is all this fiscal stimulus, all this stimulus. You got a billion dollars of non-residential construction from the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, half a trillion, I said a billion, a trillion, half a trillion from the Infrastructure Act, onshoring, the CHIPS Act. Um, in a typical downturn, uh, Non-residential construction falls about 12% over two years. All those stimulus adds up to two trillion over 10 years. And you got, when you zoom out, while there's a little cyclicality here, this is a company that's grown their earnings at 19% a year for the last 15 years. Steph, didn't you used to own United well, Rentals? I, I, yeah, for years I owned it. I think, and now a new great man, it's not, not really new anymore, but fairly new management team. They've just done a great job in terms of execution and margins. Do you have an opinion? I mean, I, I feel exactly the same on infrastructure. I own Quanta Services. I own Parker Hannifin. I mean, I own a whole bunch of them. But do you feel any? Do you feel the competition coming from something like a Caterpillar? There's uh, always a comparison between the two. Well, equipment rental. Uh, they're a Caterpillar customer. Right. They're by far the largest, and even with that, the top three companies in the U.S. account for I think less than a quarter of the whole industry. So there's still, I think, a lot of tailwinds to growth here from further consolidation. Oh, now a, now a stock very close to Stephanie Link's heart. Broadcom. Broadcom. <laughs> As we spend so much time talking about AI and these growth stocks and all the focus on NVIDIA and Steph's argument all along has been Broadcom is the way to play this because it is cheap, certainly relative to what she says NVIDIA is trading at. Table. I pass to you. One, what isn't uh, cheap next to NVIDIA? <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, and Broadcom's the least cheap it's been in a decade. Um, sure. It always amazed me. Broadcom had one of the most successful M&A uh, uh, strategies I've ever seen. They've grown their earnings at 30% a year for a decade. And yet, it wasn't until a couple months ago that the stock ever got above a 15 multiple. So it's nice as a long-term holder of Broadcom to see it get a multiple. Um, and it got a huge bump from the AI trade, probably a lot more than it deserved. You know, by our math, AI adds about 10%, perhaps a little more value to the company. You got another 10% from the recently closed acquisition of VMware. 
So it's not as expensive as the multiple may make it seem, and it's not that expensive even without that. It's about the same as a market multiple with much higher growth. Well, there's no question. Cena re-rating from 16 times earlier this year to 20, got as high as 23 times. One day it was up like 10 percent on the whole AI craze. It's now kind of pulled back to 21 times. There's no question I think the quarter is going to be mixed. I think AI is going to be able to deliver the strong growth, 50% sequential growth is expected. I do worry, though, when I look at Marvell and I look at Cisco and I look at the inventories building in networking and storage. So that's because that's a big part of their business as well. So I don't think it's going to be super clean, but I do think maybe they get bailed out from VMware because I do think VMware changes the narrative for this company to more recurring revenues, especially on the software side, which should help margins, and they already have leading in, uh, industry margins. Well, the stock doesn't always go up on every quarter, no, but I think they've like only on missed quarters. earnings once in the last decade. I know. You know, so that's over 40 quarters of beating earnings and one of missing, and I think that might have been during COVID. And know? there you go. So you buy the, you get a buying opportunity most of the time, for sure, especially if they raise the dividend and increase the buyback. Let, let's talk Uber, um, lastly. <laughs> Top of our program, we mentioned Josh Brown trimming a little bit of his, like 10%. He still loves the stock, and, and as you know, um, the chart has looked great, and the stock's now added to the S&P 500. Where is the valuation now in, in your mind of this company? Well, we talked about Uber last time I was on back in March. And since then, uh, they continue to execute as we expected them to. There's been no change to our intrinsic value, but the price is a whole lot higher. It still is a really good value here. But it used to be a great value. Um, and so, you know, if the intrinsic value doesn't go up, but the price goes up, that's a bunch of upside that's been realized that's not there for the future. So uh, I can't say we've trimmed it. it. It sounded like it was much bigger in his portfolio than ours. But you can't, you know, just because it's up doesn't mean it's worth any more. Sure. Joe? So I, I own each one of these stocks that you've spoke about today. What's the common denominator of every one of these stocks is strong revenue growth. So when, when you kind of look at being a value investor, I think of healthcare, I think of financials, none of these, none of these sit in those sectors. How do you see the type of growth that these companies can deliver to you as a value investor in sectors like financials and healthcare, which are overwhelmingly the large part of what the value story is? So one, I'd like to make, it's good to have growth, but what's more important is not to pay for it. That's why we're value investors. Paying for high growth doesn't get you great returns. Underpaying for it does. When it comes to those other sectors, um, we have a tough time investing in healthcare because so much of it is biotech and pharma, and they're so difficult to analyze and get right. When it comes to financials, uh, as I've said many times, we don't own banks. We haven't owned banks in over a decade. Wow. They're too hard to analyze, too. But there's a lot of other great businesses in financials. We own Ameriprise in wealth management, uh, affiliated managers group. You may call them financials or not, but a company like Global Payments yep. um, is as much a tech company as financial. So there's a lot of good companies we own that have good growth, that are cheap. They provide services that are financial, but they're not your classic financial services.